All right, so I'm going to go ahead and finish section 1.5. So this would be what? 1.5 B notes. On Friday, we talked about, what did we talk about? Parametric functions, parametric relations, eliminating the parameter. And we started to discuss inverse functions. We talked about, for inverse functions, the, um, all the x's and the y switch, which means the domain and the range change places. We, we learned about the horizontal line test, which told us whether or not a function's inverse would also be a function. So if a function passes the vertical line test, what we want to know is, is its inverse going to be a function? So we hit it with the horizontal line test. If it passes the horizontal line test, then we know a function and its inverse are both functions, which we would classify that as one-to-one. -one. So now we're actually going to find some inverses algebraically. We do this by switching x and y, and then getting y by itself. And once we do that, we'll call it f inverse. Of course, f of x is just the fancy way of saying the y values. So when you switch your x's and your y's, you're going to get x equals y over y plus 1. And our job is to try to get y by itself. See, this is the same skill set that you had to practice in Algebra 2, but we're going to take it to a, a higher level, right? I mean, you probably didn't deal with anything like this, trying to find the inverses of rational functions. So what do we do? Got to get y by itself. The issue that we have here is that y is in both the top and the bottom of a fraction. So the first thing we're going to have to do is get rid of the fraction. We get rid of fractions by multiplying everything by the denominator which is y plus 1. Distribute that y plus 1 to both sides. On the left side, I'm not going to skip any steps. On the left side, you would have x times y plus 1. But on the right side, all you have left is the y because the y plus 1 cancels itself out. Why what now? There we go. We're still trying to get y by itself. Well, right now you have a y inside parentheses, so what we're going to have to do is make those parentheses be gone by distributing an x. So we get x, y plus x equals y. Okay, closer. Still trying to get y by itself. And remember, anytime you're trying to get a variable by itself, you have to get all the instances of that variable to one side of the equation. And it doesn't matter which side you choose. But I'm going to go ahead and move my x, y over to the right side because there's already a positive y over there. So I'm going to subtract this x, y term from both sides. And when I do, out of space, so I'll come over here. When I do, it will leave me with, and I'm going to write the equation backwards now, y minus x, y equals x. And I'm doing that because, well, the thing I'm trying to solve for is y, and I like to have my solve for variable on the left. Also, I'm right-handed, and I'm trying to stay out of Max's way. So, you know, the more things that I can write from far away like this, yeah, the better. I'm trying to get y by itself. Ideas. What do I do? What do you guys think? Hmm. So if I were to divide both sides by x, let's just try that. You realize I have to divide everything by x, including this. And what that's going to do is it's going to create another fraction situation. So it's not divide by x, but you are on the right path. Well, I could add x to both sides, but it's still not going to get the y all alone. You were closer when you said divide. It's something you like division. Someone's, I think it was, Mc, uh, yes, McKinley, what do you think? Um, could you divide it by negative x, y? Well, if we divide by x, y, which will get rid of... Oh, inverse of x, y. Well, hold on now. You mean reciprocal. I know what you're trying to do, but if you divide by x, y, you're still going to end up with a fraction with a y in it right there. Hmm. Could you factor out a y? There it is. Factoring. You see, it's, it's a lot like division. So my folks that said divide, you were there. You were close. But yeah, what we see here is that I have a y in both of these terms. So I can factor out a y as a GCF. And when I do that, it's going to leave me with a 1 minus x. And to get y by itself, you just divide both sides by that 1 minus x. 
and it's not necessary, but I really don't like 1 minus x. It's not in standard form. You know, standard form will put the variables first, the constants later. And I don't want to have to write negative x plus 1 on the bottom of my fraction. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by negative 1. Yes, sir? Okay, so why do you get the 1 minus x? Okay, so the 1 minus x is coming from the fact that I see that both of these things have a y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undistribute the y, which is a factoring, which is a form of division. Now, I, didn't, I didn't divide both sides. What I did was I said, hmm, let me say that the multiplication by that y term never happened. What would have been left over? Well, what would have been left over is going to be right here. So if I take a y from this, which is a form of division, it leaves me that 1. I'm sorry? Uh, what do you mean that the division never happened? No, I said that the multiplication never happened. The multiplication never happened like with the original one? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, what I see is that this term and this term both have a y, which means I could, I could say that a y had been distributed there. So I'm going to undistribute that y. Oh. I'm going to pull it to, from the out. I'm going to pull it from both of them and bring it out front. And when I do, it's going to leave me behind this 1, because y divided by y is 1 and then just this x. Yeah, so it's, you're going to factor it out. You're going you're gonna to notice that it's there for both terms, and you're going to factor it out. Okay. And what I'm going to do, like I said, is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by negative 1, and that's because I don't want to see 1 minus x. Whoops, wrote that backwards. You could, but you could leave it the way it stands, but you would need to be comfortable knowing that it's also this because more than likely, this is how it would be written on my test. It's the same thing, just because we like to try to put things in standard form when we can. It's the exact same answer. It just, now it has its numerator and denominator written in standard form. It is okay if we don't write it like that, though. Like, if uh, It's okay if you don't write it like that, but like I said, you just need to be comfortable with the fact that that is the same answer because more than likely the other one would be the answer that's on my test. Cool. There we have it. Of course, that negative sign also could have been just written in front of the fraction instead of on top. Actually, that would probably be the way it's written on my test is directly in front of the fraction. But again, as long as you're comfortable with the fact that they're the same answer, you are in good shape. I'm pretty sure we mentioned this on Friday, but we have here the inverse reflection principle. Basically what it says is, when you find an inverse function, what you have done is you have reflected your original function over the line y equals x. That's what happens when you switch x and y. You were literally saying, well, if I could switch x and y, then x equals y and y equals x, reflect them over the, x, uh, the line y equals x. I'm pretty sure it's Kai that told me that that means it turns 90 degrees on its side. Was it you that said that Friday? It turns sideways, something like that. Yeah, it, the net result is the thing turns sideways, Boop, if it's a problem. That's why I always do it like that. But yeah, you're just reflecting over the line y equals x. So a comma b will become b comma a. Cool beans? Cool beans. For every single point, you just switch x and y. So how about finding an inverse function graphically using the graph? Here, I've given you some random cubic. You don't need to know its equation, unimportant. It says to sketch a graph of the function y equals f inverse of x. The way we do that is I'm going to go ahead and put the dotted line for the line y equals x to the best of my ability. I'm going to see if I can do this. It's going to go through 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. I'm just trying to try to do picture drawn to scale to the best of my ability here. So there's the line y equals x. What we're going to do is we're going to reflect over that line. The way we pull that off is by looking at some points that we can see for sure and switch their x's and their y's. The two points that I can see 100% for sure are the y-intercept and the x-intercept. Let's see, I want to draw my inverse in green. Green feels good. The y-intercept. 
that coordinate is 0 comma 1. When you switch its x and its y, you will get 1 comma 0. The x-intercept, negative 1 comma 0. When you switch x and y, 0 comma negative 1. I know those points for sure. There is one more point that I 100% know. Now, I don't actually know its coordinates, but I do see, based on my sketch, where the line y equals x intersects my original function. Any point on a line of reflection is going to stay put when you reflect. It's kind of like reaching out and poking a mirror with your finger. Your finger touches your finger, basically, because it's on the line of reflection. So anything on the line of, line of reflection will stay put. And what you want to do is you want to draw the exact same cubic only sideways, if you will. Let's see if I can do this. That's pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect, but if you turn your paper 90 degrees, 45 degrees, I should say, they should look like they are vertical reflections of one another. I did a pretty poor job, but you get the idea. And asked, is it one to one? We actually could have answered this question before we sketched the inverse. Because in order for something to be one to one, we need to pass the vertical line test, which this cubic obviously does, and the horizontal line test, which this cubic obviously does. So since the blue cubic passes both the vertical and horizontal line test, yes, f is a one-to-one -one function. And I don't like to write vertical line test and horizontal line test. It's way too many words. So we say f of x is, did I write one-to-one? -one? Nah. It's one-to-one -one because it passes the vertical line test and horizontal line test. It's pretty easy, right? Nobody said anything. I'm just gonna assume it's easy. Last lesson, not Friday, but Thursday, we did compositions. Well, here they are again. How do inverse functions and compositions relate to one another? Well, a function, a function f is one to one with inverse function f inverse or, give it a new name, g, if and only if, basically what this says is f and g cancel each other. So two things are inverses of one another, they should cancel each other in either order. So f of g of x basically would have this result, just leaving you an x. And g of f of x would give you that result, just leaving an x. Basically, it just says they had better cancel each other in both directions. Cool? It's easy, right? Cancel each other in both directions. Are there things that don't cancel in both directions? Yes, there are. This isn't one of them, though. It says, show algebraically that these two things are inverse functions. What that means is you need to do both compositions. That's how you show algebraically, do both compositions. And I'll change color again, f of g of x. So I'll plug in g into f, and g will be red. So everywhere f had an x, I'm going to put a set of parentheses, because you should always use parentheses when you're substituting. That's what f looks like with a set of parentheses where x was, and I'll drop in g, cube root of x minus 1. Well, what happens is the third power and third root will cancel, and the result is x minus 1 from the inside of the parentheses, parentheses not necessary anymore, plus 1. And negative 1 plus 1 is x. So there, we've seen that f and g cancel each other in that direction. Can't assume that the other one will automatically work, so you do have to show it. G of 
f of x. All right, well, we got g, cube root of something. Where it had an x, I'm going to put a set of parentheses. Minus 1. And I'm going to drop x cubed plus 1 right there because that is what f of x equals. Parentheses are like seatbelts. You use them just in case they were necessary. Well, this is one of those times where, yeah, they didn't do anything. So you could basically just forget that they're there. Well, that's the wrong color. Let's drop them. Don't, don't need them. So we have the cube root of x to the third plus 1 minus 1. And, of course, the plus 1 and minus 1 will cancel out. It's going to leave me the cube root of x to the third. And once again, third roots cancel third powers, just x. Plus or minus is not required. Plus or minus only happens when you cancel an even power with an even root. Would it not be inverse if it was plus or minus? Right. So if, if one of the two directions generated a plus or minus, then that would force them to not be true inverses of one another because it must be exactly equal to x when you do the composition. And actually, Max, that is the one time that I know of in our curriculum that the inverse composition doesn't work in both directions. It happens specifically whenever there's a plus or minus case, which is parabolas. See, parabolas cause us problems. If you think about the shape of a parabola, it's u-shaped, right? This is obviously a function, but it fails the horizontal line test, which means its inverse is not a function. Does that mean that it doesn't have an inverse? No. What it means is that it has two inverses, almost like the implicitly defined functions that we were working with before. Remember when I took a circle and I cut it into, I divide, um, not divide, what's the word? I split it into two different functions. One had a plus in front and one had a minus in front. You guys remember that? The same thing happens with parabolas. When you find a parabola's inverse, you had better get a square root function. So what you have to do is you have to say, well, which one am I looking for? Because this parabola could technically be described as two different things a left side and a right side so that when you turn it over and it's nice actually that the hands match this left side for you when you turn it over wait i'm backwards hold on i gotta see the reflection this left side for you becomes the bottom because it's the far side it becomes the bottom parabola or bottom uh, square root graph Whereas this right side for you, when you turn it over, becomes the positive square root. So we will play with the pluses and minuses and things like that, probably in my practice questions. But that won't be on the test, will it? I'm sorry? The parabola won't be on the test? Uh, it could be. But don't worry, I would never put something surprise on a test. I don't believe in math surprises. They are mean. The only surprises I ever get my kids with is like surprise extra credit or surprise that test is going to be moved back because we're not ready, things like that. Only good surprises come from my class. Oh, look, a square root graph. How about that? How about that? So this example is called finding an inverse function that requires a domain restriction. This graph is a square root graph. But the inverse operation of square rooting is squaring. That was like really Trumpy right there when I just did. Uh, the squaring function, though, is a parabola, two sides. The square root graph is a one-sided graph. So we have an issue because its reflection over the line y equals x should only be half of a parabola. So what we have to do is we have to restrict our domain of the parabola to guarantee that these two things are true inverses. So it says, show that the square root of x plus 3 has an inverse function, and then find a rule for it. That means find its equation. That's what that means. And then we have to state any restrictions on the domain of f and f inverse. 
And I have a really nifty trick for this in case you didn't learn it in Algebra 2. Let's go ahead and find our inverse algebraically. x equals the square root of y plus 3. So we've switched x and y. We need to cancel our radical by squaring both sides. You mean switching the x and y? No, by like, all right, so you take away the radical and you put a to the power of 2, and then you put a negative in front of the x and then put a negative in front of 3. Wouldn't that be the answer? Well, the problem is, so he was asking, couldn't you were trying to jump straight to the answer right away, but that really only worked because you had the graph. Like if I didn't show you a graph and I just gave you a random function, there is a way to shortcut your way to the answer, but I want to show all the math that proves that the shortcut works. I don't like shortcuts unless I can prove they work all the time. So the first thing I would do is algebraically I would find it and then I would use my graph and then from there I can develop a quote unquote rule for you guys that will always work for square roots and parabolas. There we go, forgot the word for a moment. That gives me x squared equals y plus 3. Now this does not create a plus or minus situation. Plus or minuses only happen when you cancel a even power with an even root. See this is the other way around. So this does not create a plus or minus. And I get y by itself by subtracting 3 from both sides. Okay, this is a parabola. Its vertex would be at 0, negative 3. It's supposed to be at 0, 0, but this thing has been shifted down 3 units if you remember your transformations from Algebra 2. Hmm, 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 hmm. So if you are writing in pen, do not do what I'm about to do. Just hold your horses for a moment. What I'm going to do is I am going to graph x squared minus 3 on that grid. I see its vertex should be at 0, comma, negative 3. And let me plug in x equals 1. It gives me 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. And since it is a parabola, it should be symmetric. And one more point for good measure. Oops, that was the wrong. One more point for good measure. Let me plug in x equals 2. 4 minus 3 is 1. Okay. And it's going to go right there. So let's see. So we go there. Okay, very simple, right? There's f inverse of x. My problem is that that is a two-sided graph clearly not the reflection of the blue graph. So let me draw the line y equals x as a dotted line. This you can do if you're writing in pen. And now let's go through and do what we did on the last example, and that is just take some x comma y's that we can see on the blue graph and switch x and y. The first point that I see on the blue graph is negative 3, comma, 0. We switch its x and y, and we get 0, comma, negative 3. Oh, look, right there, the vertex of the parabola. Great. But the next point that exists on that blue graph is negative 2, comma, 1. We switch x and y, 1, comma, negative 2. And as you can see, this is giving me the right side of the parabola only. So then I can tell you that one side of my graph does not exist. It's the left side. It only existed to the right of the vertex. There. Anytime you are finding inverse functions between square roots and radical between square roots and squares this is always going to happen. So what we have to do is we have to restrict the domains to make sure that they are true inverses of one another. So the domain of my red graph, oh, it's still in the eraser. The domain of my red graph is x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, this parabola is a true inverse of that square root function because I restricted its domain to greater than or equal to zero. We see that. 
the left side where the negative x's happened don't exist. The reason why? The quote unquote negative side of the square root function doesn't exist. It only exists above the x axis in the positive y zone. That means its inverse should only exist in the positive x zone. Because remember, when you find an inverse, you're switching all the x's and all the y's. That means you're switching the domain and the range. So the domain of the inverse must be the range of the original function. So if you have the ability to look at this and see its range based off of transformations alone, then you know the domain of the inverse. You don't have to graph it as long as you remember your transformations. So how do we do that? Got some space down here. In case you don't remember how. Let's see. So if I give you, I'm writing the generic square root function. A times the square root of x minus h plus k. This graph has four options. Up and to the right, jokes, up and to the right, down and to the right, up and to the left, and down and to the left. And you should be able to just look at the equation and see, quote unquote, see which two directions it points. Is it up and to the right? Is it down and to the right? Is it up and to the left? Is it down and to the left? How would you know? Well, the number on front is A, correct? Well, just like parabolas, if the front number is positive, the graph points up. So these two are for A positive numbers. And that's just a transformation trick. Uh, well, if it equals zero, you don't have a square root bar. So strictly greater. And if the front number is negative, just like parabolas, that makes it points down. Makes it point down. I can speak. So that's based on transformations alone. Now that just tells you up and down. So where does the left and right come from? The left and right comes from the letter that I forgot to write. And that's because generally you don't see it all that often, but it's whatever number happens to be in front of X. If I had decided to horizontally stretch and shrink this thing because I'm mean, but if I put a number in front of X, and remember that number could be one or negative one. Scooby doo So we know that Positive x's are to the right, correct? So the two arrows that point to the right are when the number in front of x is positive. It's just transformations. It points towards the positive x's. And it points left when it points towards the negative x's. So if the number, aka the symbol, in front of x is a negative sign, then it's going to point left. So those are just transformation tricks. I teach this to my Algebra 2 regular students, and they can grasp it. So I have full confidence that you can as well. But it requires knowledge of transformations. Now I'd like to take this little trick that I've developed here and go up to the top, if you don't mind. Pretend you hadn't graphed it at all. Pretend you haven't graphed it at all. Here's what I would do if this was me on my homework, and I was told to restrict the domain. I would have first asked myself, hmm, what two ways does this graph point? I see the number in front of the square root symbol is a positive one, so I know it points up. I see the number in front of my x is a positive one, so I know it points to the right. I don't need the graph. I can see based on transformations that the graph looks like this. That means this thing's range must be the domain of the inverse. So as long as I know what its range is, I'll know what the domain of f inverse is. OK. Well, what is its range? Huh. Well, look at the picture. And again, this is all from transformations. Look at the picture. That one's range is y is greater than or equal to 0. 
So where would we have seen that in the equation? This number right here is either the beginning or the end of the range because that is the y value of the square root graph's vertex. The one up above, there was no number out there. So the beginning or end of its range was zero. So as long as you know that it points up and to the right, then its range must be greater than or equal to this number out here, which happens to be a zero. So since this range is y is greater than or equal to zero, the domain of its inverse must be x is greater than or equal to zero. So I know that was a long explanation, but to be honest with you, it's a very simple trick. It's a very simple trick. And we will practice it. But that is it for the notes. I, I would assume that there's probably a question or two out in the crowd about what you just saw. Yeah, McKinley, what's up? The video notes gonna go up from like from Friday and today. Well, Friday's notes are up. I put them up last night, but it was late because uh, I don't do my work on the weekends until late Sunday night, much like my students. Ah, got him. Uh, but tonight's notes, hopefully today's notes will be up sometime. I, I would hope before I go home. Fingers crossed, of course. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's see. I think we should probably use get a little bit of practice on this skill. Yeah? You guys think? Okay. Then let's clear this slide and move over to my practice stuff. Before we find the inverse of this function, which is going to involve factoring, I want to go to this. And what I would say is do it without the picture. Find a formula for the inverse and properly restrict its domain. Stop texting on his phone. Give him back his phone. Anyway, find an equation for its inverse, which it will be a parabola, but properly restrict its domain based on the direction that this thing points and what its range is, because the range of the original will be the domain of the inverse. So I'll go ahead and pause the video while you guys are working on that just for a momentito. Alrighty. So, just transformations. Just transformations. See, I deleted the picture. We're going to use the tricks. Here's what I know. Because of this symbol right there, this thing points down. And because of the symbol in front of X, which is positive, I know that this thing points to the right. So without having a graph, I know it looks something like this. It's quote unquote vertex. It's not a true vertex, but we'll call it that. It's vertex would be, and this works for parabolas as well, and cubics. What makes the inside equal zero? comma, the number to the far right. That's what this graph would have looked like had I graphed it. Its range is everything at four and below. So you would actually write that as negative infinity to positive four. So when you found its inverse function, and hopefully you got to here, because you were supposed to switch x and y and get the inverse function, Let's see, he would have gotten, looks like x minus 4 quantity squared plus 1. Hopefully that's what you got for f inverse by switching x and y. When you squared both sides, you would have squared your negative sign, which gave you back a positive. So that's what happened when you did that algebra. We, did we all get to there? Yes? So the, the negative when you square both sides, think of it here. I'll go ahead and show it real quick. That did nothing. Why did that do nothing? There we go. 
So the first thing we would have done was subtract 4 from both sides, right? So we would have had, well, we would have switched x and y. x equals negative sine square root y minus 1 plus 4, right? So first you subtract 4 from both sides. Now, multiply both sides by negative 1. But I'm not going to actually distribute it if you're okay with that. Instead, I'm going to write it like this. And now, I'm going to square both sides. When you do, it requires you to square this set of parentheses and the negative 1. But when you square the negative 1, you get positive 1. So it goes away. And squaring the radical, cancel the radical. And then we just add one to both sides. Of course, this is not the answer until we restrict our domain. And the domain of our inverse had better be the range of the original. So x must be less than or equal to 4 would be this thing's domain. That is the true inverse. I wanted to do one more question with you, and I'm going to do it as notes just to make sure it makes it to the video. I am going to post this set of practice questions because it is five questions to Blackboard. I encourage you to go through the other three and try to get them right. I want to do this one because I want, to, I want you to see some of the factoring and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and find the inverse of this function. First, I switch x and y. Just like in the notes, since I'm trying to get y by itself and it exists in the top and bottom of the fraction, I'm going to multiply everything by the bottom of the fraction. I'm going to distribute it to both sides the equal sign. Well, on the left, I have an x sitting outside of y plus 1. And on the right, the y plus 1's cancel and leave me with a 2y minus 3. We must distribute our x. And at this point, you need to get all your y's to one side and all your non-y's to the other side. Can I just subtract the y plus 1? You subtract the y plus 1, you mean right here? Mm -hmm. I can't subtract it because it's being multiplied to the x. So I'd be, quote unquote, dividing by the y plus 1, but that would undo the fact that I just multiplied by it. Okay. So if I get all the x's to one side, all the y's to one side, and all the non x's, and all the non y's to the other side, it'll look something like this. I want to bring this xy over here. I'm going to bring this minus 3 over here, giving me x plus 3 equals 2y minus xy. On the right side, you factor out the y again, just like we did in the notes. And now you divide both sides by the 2 minus x. So it could be written like this, or because that bottom is not in standard form, I could bring a negative sign to the front of the fraction, and this is probably what it would look like on the test, because that's much easier to deal with. And that's how it's done. Because I need to scroll, yeah? 